welcome to the stage, Dr. David Spiegel. All right. Thank you so much. You probably think I have a ton of great stories to tell you as being a shrink, okay? I'm not going to tell you those, all right? What I am going to tell you is a survival story which takes a really unique turn. It's not a sad story. It's actually a very amusing story. So I was 24 years old, uh, third year medical student, and got the news, uh, felt a lump in my uh, testicle, went to my uh, doctor there, expecting to say you have a torsion or something, you're a hypochondriac, that's why you go in psychiatry. And so I was like, yeah, I expect. And then the guy like sits on me and he goes, looks at me really seriously. He goes, I think you have testicular cancer. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. let's try this again. All right, wasn't expecting this news. Anyway, this is not a survival story because this is not the right organization. That's for the cancer group, all right? I've obviously made it. I'm 26 years out. So I'm thinking I'm going to live from that. This is a story of what happens after you get the diagnosis of testicular cancer between the week of that and then the week where you're about to start treatment. So let me get right into it. Let me get right into it. So I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, a relatively big cancer center in New York um, with the oncologist. And brings over, brings over a little cup that you know I mean, you have to put saliva in and stuff like that. And then he flips me a card. It's weird, what is this about? The card says, you know, the premier bank in Manhattan. So, of course, I'm thinking I got cancer. I don't know what the heck's going on. I know I have cancer. And so it slips me this. And then on the back of it, it's a number that actually says, you know, sperm bank. All right, so I'm thinking, you don't really want a funny oncologist, all right? What, I, I don't need a funny oncologist, right? I'm, I'm thinking I'm dying, I'm 24, all right? So I get the, the only humorous oncologist in the city of New York treating me. All right, so make an appointment because with testicular cancer, there is that risk that you're not gonna be able to produce children for obvious reasons. So make the appointment, make the appointment, call the people up, and let me tell you what's not in a sperm bank. This is bank does not have a vault full of money. Okay, there's no money, there's nothing like that back there. Let me tell you the inner workings of a sperm bank, all right? Keeping in mind that I was just diagnosed with cancer about 24 hours ago, all right? So, head into the sperm bank, nice lady at the desk, welts me back in there, and this is like a 24 year old guy's dream. If I had cell phone, I was gonna call my, par my parents, my friends up, slip, Freudian slip, sorry, all right? <laughs> not gonna call my parents up, not gonna call my parents. This is not what they wanna see their son do. Uh, so, so, you're in here, they take you to the room, the treatment room, where you make your deposit, all right, without a slip, no money, you go in there, walk in there, you have this television on, this is a 1980s television, right, so it's like, you know, all those bulky things that come out there, which is just playing porn videos, all right, the whole time. Then you have these, they had porn magazines I didn't even know existed when I was 24 in there, all lined up nice and neat and packed for your desire. The walls are on porn, the floor is porn. Like I said, if I had a cell phone, I'd call my 24 year old friends and say, you guys gotta come over here. We can see this for free, all right? <laughs> Never ever leave, all right? Well, again, with testicular cancer in the background, this just wasn't cutting it. This just wasn't cutting it. All I kept thinking to myself is, who in God's name have touched these magazines and the doorknobs and God, why am I in here? It's not romantic at all. That's why I got married right afterwards because this was not romantic. My wife's here now. Still works, the parts still work. So, <laughs> left there thinking that's it, no more lineage for me, it's over. That's all that's gonna happen. Well, unbeknownst to me, my cousin, about two years older than me, married someone who had testicular cancer. They're like 25 or 26, whatever they are, and she like, offers me her Manhattan apartment, fully well knowing what I'm about to do. Okay, I'm gonna go in there, make a deposit in this cup on her sheets and God knows what else, and she's letting me do this. And I'm like, you, wow, that is, I wouldn't do that, that's disgusting. All right, so again, fast forwarding. The viability time of a pocket of these guys, in case you don't know and I'm educating you, is 15 minutes without being put on ice. All right, so it's gotta be refrigerated in 15 minutes, all right? The bank, the premier bank, by the way, is about probably, you know, 13, 14 minutes if I'm running. All right, so I do my business. I have a little, using this as a plastic, not plastic, but paper bag, has a coffee thing on the outside, like Dunkin' Donuts. I don't want people to know my business, think I got coffee, 
All right. So I'm running in New York, running the streets, you know, offense, defense. I'm dodging people, running over people. Cab drivers are cursing me because I got to be there in 15 minutes or I got to do this whole thing over again, maybe at the bank. All right. So running through, dodging left and right. Finally get that. I can see heaven. All right. There's the sperm bank. I'm right there. All the more I'm thinking, I got cancer. I let my guard down for one second, one second, and then someone runs into me. Of all the times for a New Yorker to be nice, they decided to pick this time, <laughs> all right? So this person picks up my open bag, thinking it's coffee, and is like, <laughs> stunned, and cause still doesn't know what's going on exactly. So the sperm bank's right there. Of course, I'm running in there right afterwards. Thank you, sir, I gotta get out of here. I'm running, the, running in there. And this guy is like, he's still in therapy with me to this day. 25 years later, her post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm not charging him. Uh, Dr. Flenner's out there, my boy. Don't tell anyone. All right. We're losing money. All right. So I finally make it, run in there, give them the, give them the deposit. They don't even take my money. They run the thing back there. God knows that these people front desk, like they hold this all the time. And the money. I mean, I'm giving them money like, you know, you know what I just did right here. It's all sticky together. Uh, never mind, never mind. So anyway. All right. So now, make it fast forward a week. I'm in Sloan Kettering, premier cancer hospital in the nation, about to get my surgery, night before. And a surgeon walks in the night before, night before walks in there and said, listen, we've been notified by the bank that you need to produce another sample. I'm like, I, <laughs> I'm not running down to the bank at 6.30 the night right before my surgery. You can forget about that. Offer me pain meds, offer me Xanax. Up the offer, I may take it, okay? So, because don't worry, don't worry, we have a secluded room for you. And I'm like, because I have a roommate. This is an old hospital. I'm show you. We have a secluded room. So the guy like puts a drape between the two of us. Go. <laughs> Do you know what I've been through this week, sir? I'm about to get surgery. You want me to go in the middle? I, anyway, God knows how it worked. I must have been your average 24-year-old because I was able to do what I had to do. All right. So surge, fast forward, surgery goes well, right? Everything's great. Surgery, well, I'm, I'm here now, things are great. All right. But they put in a, you know, they put in a prosthesis for the stuff back then. And this is 1980. They, we don't have very classy prosthesis back in 19, 1980. All right. Get married to my lovely wife, Lisa, who's still here, okay, with me. God knows why. All right. Going through the airport, and here I'm thinking to myself, on our honeymoon, I'm thinking to myself, is this thing going to ring? Like, if I go through here, and like metal, are they gonna like, <laughs> sir, what do you have in there? None of your business what I have in there, sir. All right, how does the story end? Every story's gotta have an ending and not death, okay, in this case. So, come back from the honeymoon, still really, you know, have no kids, still haven't checked the goods out yet. I don't know if anything's working or not. Well, come to be, thank God. Conceive my first child, conceive my second child, making $19,000 a year as a resident. And the, the, the bank has a yearly fee of $1,000. Now, I'm making $19,000 a year, all right? This, so my wife, we got to cut some expenses down here. And I'm like, well, what expense are you talking about? And we got to get rid of the stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of attached to it. I've been through a lot and just want to get rid of it. Want to throw it out, throw them out. You've seen television shows, right? God knows I'm going to have 27 kids show up and say I'm the biological father because they're just going to throw it out. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened to that to this day. Um, and if I can just entertain you with one more story along that same line, then I'm going to cut out. Um, in third year medical school, now keep in mind, this is the first year out of surgery. First year out of surgery. You have to go every month to Sloan to, to make sure you're going to live, and it's kind of a scary thing. At the same time, I was taking my third year psychiatry clerkship, all right? Um, now, I'm living in sin with my wife, okay, with fiance then at my in-law's place. They're not my in-laws now, they're just my wife's, my fiance's parents. So my, my darling 75-year-old, 74-year-old mother-in-law uh, comes up to me, and I just finished this appointment at Sloan, right? She did not know, she did not know that I was at Sloan. She thought I was in the psychiatry clerkship, seeing my patients. And so 75-year-old woman 
comes up to you, finishing Sloan, I just came out, relatively harassing day, you're getting x-rays, you're getting blood drawn, you're happy to be alive, and she comes, thinking I just finished my psychiatry clerkship, and says to me, so how are you nuts? <laughs> how, what? My, 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 n n n n so anyway, I was wondering, and I still to this day never confronted her on that, I wonder what she thought I thought. Anyway, I'm going to close with this one line, y'all. Um, the definition of insanity, the definition of insanity is not hearing voices. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, usually inappropriate, and expecting different results. Well, I can truly say this organization, four kids, doing the same thing over and over again, and actually getting it right. Thank you very much. Thank you.